Thank you, Matt. So I uh, didn't get the memo, but I managed to run in time to get my, my hat. This is a student's hat that you get at the University of Technology in, in Finland. We're all proud of this little black thing because the normal students just have that. So, so I, I hope I now conform to the specifications of how to present the Pocona Live. It's wonderful. You're great. It's great. Yep. So I suppose I should share my screen now, just a second. So do you get my slides? Yes, we can see them. You can see it. Okay. So great. Hello, Balcona Live Online and good time of day. Um, this is my first virtual keynote and it's a bit hard to look you in the eyes and even know how many of you there are. I've seen the um, YouTube uh, chat and there's a Slack chat and lots of activities going on, but uh, while I'm presenting, I'm not going to, to look at that. There are others present from the MariaDB Foundation, so you can, you can uh, interact with them there. I'm really excited to see how a, a virtual uh, conference and virtual keynote will will work, work out. And I consciously uh, started by greeting you with a time agnostic good time of day greeting because it's now half past six in the evening where I sit in, in Munich and my colleagues in Central Europe and South Africa. It's half past seven in the evening for my colleagues in Romania, Bosnia and my native Finland. And I have to remind myself that the audience in the Eastern US time zone has early afternoon and those in California just half past nine in the morning. So thank you, uh, Pakona, for putting together Pakona Live and taking it online and making then the live stream available for the poor people not having, being awake at this point in time. I'm thinking of Daniel Black, a uh, uh, frequent contributor to Maria Devi in Canberra, Australia. He has 2.30 a.m. right now. Okay, so uh, MariaDB 10.4 and the competition, that's my topic. You could say that's a fairly specific one for a keynote, but the subheader here is, is the more descriptive one on the process of selecting the right database. So that's what I'm going to be uh, talking about. So how to select the database is really a basic question, uh, but people cut corners when they answer it. In practice, they, they look into questions like, what do I know? What am I familiar with? What databases have I already invested in, in time or money or skills? And what do uh, my friends use or my role model, the, the cool guys? Um, the client might expect something or use or, or even require a certain database. And uh, we know from the development or rise of new databases that they usually go hand in hand with uh, 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 the development environment and the database go hand in hand like uh, PHP and MySQL went together. Uh, so what's the default for your environment? Will the database choice please the boss? And if you're still in doubt and still don't know what database to choose, then what sounded cool at the conference? So this is what you will end up with if you choose the path of least resistance. That's how databases are really uh, chosen. And obviously the, the important questions are left out here. I'll get back to them. So that was how to choose a database in practice. Now, um, uh, you also sometimes pretend to choose a database. So formalities uh, sometimes put a bit of hurdles uh, for that path of, of uh, least resistance. A new project might require some kind of a formal decision process or an assessment of the right database. But how the world sadly works in practice is that you've already made up your mind and then uh, based on the practical questions that I listed uh, above. And, and now you need to uh, find the answer to the riddle. How can you persuade your co-decision makers that your uh, defined answer is the right one? So where do you find the best supportive arguments for your case? And how can you dress up your suggestion in numbers, usually TCO figures? But that's not what I'm going to talk about here. I'm lo looking at triggers for 
when you really make a fresh choice of a database. So sometimes you do need uh, to make a real choice. And I see several types of, of triggers for making such a choice. Uh, it can come from the application life cycle, from the database life cycle, and it can come from uh, for money reasons. So the application life cycle is fairly obvious. It's, it's uh, the phase of uh, development or prototyping or minimum viable product. At the beginning of each of those, you have to either go with the flow or then make a conscious decision. And uh, the general framework I will present towards the core of, of, of my keynote, that's where I'm going to take a look at those answers. But now, uh, before that, I'm going to look at, at the other impulses, the monetary and database lifecycle impulses. So, monetary impulses. Um, it used to be something that never happened, say, 10 years ago. It was the established wisdom when I was working with MySQL uh, 10, 10 to uh, almost 20 years ago. But now, uh, there is something, a new concept happening, a, a midlife crisis of applications, uh, where you have a smoothly running working system with no technical pain and no maintenance needed, and yet we see migrations happening in this situation. And that's a trend change. Such choices are triggered then by, by money, by cost reasons. Customers paying too much for the current licenses. Of course, that's not the case if you are with Postgres or My, MySQL or with any other open source database, but not so if you're with, say, Oracle. I'm talking Oracle, Oracle, not Oracle MySQL, meaning Oracle Database 19C or some other version. So MariaDB Server has got quite a bit of traction from large users migrating their existing applications for cost reasons. So, uh, never touch a running system seems to be a, a wisdom from the past. Yes, if it ain't broke, why fix it? That's true, but it not, may not be technically broken. Still, it is often financially broken. And then you need to fix the cost, and that in, uh, in turn has technical implications. So, so all of that said, I do think that never touch a running system still is true if and only if there are no support or maintenance costs for the product. So then coming to the life cycle, not of the application, but of the database. And we heard Bruce here talk a lot about it, and I'm not talking about individual releases here, not about uh, the eternity of, of Postgres. Um, so, the most frequent need for a rational decision to choose a new database, that's triggered by this life cycle of a database major release that you're currently using. New releases come and old releases go. And uh, Lefred here uh, spoke about MySQL 8, and there may be users of MySQL 5.7 among you who now think about what to do now. Now, if you follow the path of least resistance, and why wouldn't you? You postpone any upgrade. And that is often wise for old working systems that don't incur any cost. But then the vendor proclaims end of life, after which you won't get any security fixes. And um, there are differences in these life cycles, and that's a criterion for, for selecting which database you want to have. So, so let's take a look at, at this. At MariaDB, on this slide, you see we just end of life MariaDB 5.5. And that's due to the maintenance policy of the MariaDB Foundation, which states that we are committed to maintaining each release for not an eternity, but for five years. So MariaDB 5.5 was announced for GA on 11th of April 2012. So EOL was originally 2017. And at that point, we extended it by three years because it was widely used still 5.5 in, in Linux, excuse me, in Linux distributions. And it still is the biggest one on, so 5.5 is still the biggest, uh, most widely used release on WordPress. 
On a scale of 5 pi at their last build in 2018, we've continued a while after that to apply security uh, patches on a quarterly basis. So if you're willing then to, to take the risk of running your database without any security fixes, of course, there's nobody who will stop you from doing that. And you can even apply the security fixes yourself if you really don't want to touch anything in the application. So in the blog that I uh, showed here, on a blog on the end of life of 5.5, we noted that uh, scientists are contemplating how to resurrect the mammoth from old DNA. Well, in the blog ends, we also point to this very GitHub page with the complete DNA of MariaDB 5.5. So we try to make it easy for everyone to have a choice, even under fairly extreme uh, circumstances. So the message I'm trying here to gently convey between the lines is that laziness in upgrades of open source database may be a virtue. At least it should be your choice when, when to upgrade. And if your choice is not to touch a working system, getting security fixes for a long time is clearly a good thing. And the track record of MariaDB server here is uh, one where we just end up like the product eight years, not an eternity still, but eight years after we announced it as GA. So now I'm coming to this core framework for how I think a, a smart database choice uh, can and should, should be made. So um, I'm not going to give you an exact recommendation like upgrade to MariaDB 10.4 right away, regardless of whether you are on MySQL 5.7 or MySQL 8.0, on Aurora or Postgres or MongoDB or Oracle Oracle. And that's of course not credible, nor, nor does it help you in any way. And I'm also not going to list a lot of features. Others have gone to more features here than I will do. I will not prove why MariaDB 10.4 is the best database since EFCON and CJ date. A developed relational theory or since Mark Zuckerberg uh, launched Facebook on an early version of, of MySQL. If you're interested to learn more about MariaDB features during Procona Live Online, listen to Colin, Colin Charles' presentation. I believe that will be of interest to you. So what I am going to talk about is, is the questions that you may uh, do well in asking yourself and your colleagues when you make a decision on databases. These, these questions are agnostic to your role. You might be, might be a DBA, a developer, a sysadmin, or just a mere decision, decision maker. And I'm uh, like here uh, on this picture, separating the questions in the framework to three areas, technology, business, and ethics. So technology would be about features, performance, stability, ease of use, scalability, high availability. Business would be about cost, direct cost or indirect cost, availability of talent, product life cycle, being future proof and reducing vendor lock-in. Ethics would then be about open source, business models, development models, openness, contributing to a better world and community and governance. I'm not putting any particular weight to technical versus business versus ethical issues. That's again your choice. I'm just giving the framework to help you make a decision according to your own will and, and your specific situation. So technology first. Should you run your database in the cloud or on premise? Well, do whatever fits your time budget and your cost budget. Setting up services in the cloud may give you quick time to market. And we heard here from Matt AC about how cool the cloud, cloud is. However, beware vendor lock-in in the cloud. So cloud is the new functionality trap. In the pre-cloud world, databases came with nice to have functionality. And they gave benefits, short-term development benefits. You could save a bit of coding here and there. But then you tie the knot with the database. And then disentangling your application from, say, Oracle is so painful that you would rather not go through that experience. Then later on, you regret yourself. So had the original developers had more discipline in not using proprietary extensions, the application may have cost 10% more to develop initially, 
but over the lifetime have saved that development cost many times over on license cost. Now there is a similarity. Uh, the, the same logic may apply to the cloud. It may be unwise to tie the knot so tightly with a cloud vendor that you cannot move to another one to run your database and app on-prem or in, a, in another cloud. So then moving to uh, the question, should you pick a relational database or a NoSQL database? And here, uh, the slide I have for this is uh, a YouTube video made by uh, MariaDB Foundation, the Chancellor Travar, where he introduces uh, the JSON support in MariaDB, just as a symbol for this topic. So my answer on whether to use a NoSQL database or not is, well, first of all, in memory, in, in your application, do use well-structured data objects in your development environment, and don't try to mimic database relations in your in-memory data structures. But the opposite, the reverse, also applies. Don't let your usage of JSON to structure data for your application distract you from the right choice of model for data persistence. Okay, I am partial, but I do argue that relations are easiest for storage of most well-structured data. Now, not all data is well-structured. A uh, text document is data, but not well-structured. The borderline between a text document and a classic relational table, that might be clear, but there are entities somewhere in between, midway. A complex structured JSON object lies somewhere in between the, the two. And if it is both too big and too complex at the same time, I argue that it's wise to make it smaller and less complex. And then you can quite well store the smaller and less complex JSON object in a relational database. So let me put this into a bit of a perspective. I'm old enough to remember the world before relational. It was called hierarchical or network databases. The complex data structure were stored directly on disk and the language used to manipulate that data was complex too. It really was a mess. Relations by contrast are simple. They rely on simple mathematics and the language used to manipulate the data it's just insert, update, delete. In the hierarchical days, we used to spend a lot of time cleaning up dirty data. Dirty meaning data full of exceptions and inconsistencies, which were not just allowed by these pre-relational data structures, but they were perpetuated by them. They were hard to discover and hard to fix. And now NoSQL is quite a lot the same thing. Non-relational used to be a curse word for a reason. So my suggestion, keep order. The earlier you fix a program bug, the less costly it is. And the same for inconsistent data. Discipline does help. So clean your data in memory and store the cleaned up data in a relational table. That seems to be a logical conclusion also for millennial developers. So next topic, and uh, you'll see soon why I chose this slide, should you pick an open source database or a closed source one? Now in this conference, I might be preaching to the choir. Uh, I see few reasons to go for a closed source database. Of course, closed source proprietary databases still exist today, but mostly I see them as a relic from past times. The question is more, should you still allow a closed source database in production environments? And that then becomes one of a question of capacity to migrate and sensitivity to cost. Uh, the case in point here is the slide, DBS Bank Development Bank of Singapore. It's one of Asia's largest uh, banks and most profitable banks and one of the most high-tech banks in the world. And out of over 300 Oracle applications, they migrated nearly all of Oracle because of the Oracle compatibility layer in MariaDB, which they sponsor. So instead of converting their applications of Oracle, they contributed to converting MariaDB into something that could run their Oracle apps. So if you then pick relational open source database, 
It says, how should you choose between MariaDB, MySQL, and Postgres? This is a sensitive topic. You all expect me to recommend MariaDB and to reverse engineer the best possible logic that speaks for MariaDB. I will disappoint you and, and give very little in that direction. I will not enter the battlefield of global transaction IDs for replications and which one came first and which one is better. I may have an opinion on it, but it's slightly not better than yours, and at least it's not based on using a lot of it. In the question of Postgres versus MySQL or MariaDB, I would point to the origins of the products. So Postgres is originally an academic project that turned into a product with lots of functionality. When I picked my first open source database at the end of last century, it was Postgres. It was more known and uh, won MySQL on a feature-by-feature -feature basis. So MySQL, by contrast, had pragmatic starting points. Performance stability, ease of use, whether kingpins, and it didn't even have full transactional support until Berkeley, until Berkeley DB came along, which then was substituted by InnoDB. And in those early days, it won hard server Postgres based on performance and stability and ease of use, and lost some battles based on functionality. Now, since then, the products have grown closer to each other, MySQL and now MariaDB got more functionality and Postgres got more ease of use performance and stability. But you can still see the traces of history. Then in the question of MariaDB versus MySQL, they fought already quite a long time ago. So compatibility, compatibility remains strong up until MySQL 5.7, but since MySQL 8 no longer is backwards compatible with itself or with MySQL 5.7, it isn't compatible with MariaDB either. So we could claim MariaDB 10.4 is more compatible with MySQL 5.7 than MySQL 8 is. So um, the, uh, the actual uh, questions that help here, I see as the following. So uh, what database can solve my current requirements? What is likely to satisfy my future needs? How is it, is, is it to use to upgrade? Will it scale? Is it included in the Linux distros? Uh, does it support all uh, many platforms? Where can I get help? And how is it easy is it to move between systems to the cloud or, or back from the cloud? My uh, point here is, is uh, uh, I'm limited to two items that I will highlight. It's distros and release models. So presence in the distros I see as a, as a quality characteristic that implies answers to the earlier questions here on the slide. Um, uh, even though you might not be evaluating them right now, they might come in handy later, such as multi-platform or security issues. The other key items I will stress is the release model. So it also uh, comes from, from this easy upgrades scenario. I believe in the industry standard practice of a clear separation between feature releases and bug fix releases. So once a product is DA, New bugs should be a rare thing. And it won't be a rare thing if new features are introduced. So that's a reason why, personally, I would be reluctant to choose uh, MySQL 8 for production use uh, right now. Uh, the next uh, business uh, questions. So the choice of a database is not just technical, it's one about cost. And cost is more than licenses. Um, does the database have a base of skilled developers, DBAs and sysadmins? Is there traction for the database? Is it growing? Is it available everywhere on, on all the distros? Um, what's the security policy of the vendor? What entity controls the roadmap of the database? And what's the plan of that owner and the track record? How long are the releases supported? Um, here again, I, I highlight the audit work done by Debian and other key Linux uh, distributions because no matter whom you ask of the vendors themselves, they will of course doubt their own horn and, and portray themselves in the best uh, light. So uh, here, uh, between the lines, I'm, I'm sure you see that, that uh, I'm hinting to MariaDB already years ago uh, becoming a default for Debian and most other Linux distributions. This does not make us angels and everybody else a devil, but it is one non-biased way of picking between MySQL and the So ethical questions, the third and last category after technology and business. 
it's a big word, ethics. It touches upon things brought up uh, by others here. I suppose one could put it under business, but I chose to single out questions around mentality and culture under this header. Using such a big word may seem arrogant, but it's not the intention. It's not a question of who are the better human beings. It's just a grouping of questions that come from the culture in which the database originated and from product ownership in a financial sense. So a good general question here, I think, is qui bono, the Latin for whom does it benefit, in whose interest is it? And um, uh, one example of this are the incidents on Planet MySQL and Planet MariaDB recently, where Planet MySQL excluded blog entries just mentioning MariaDB as a character string, which upset Chomino, Jean-Francois Garnier, and others. So we decided to do the opposite. Instead of blacklisting MySQL, we whitelisted. So we whitelisted, uh, obviously, MariaDB, and also MySQL, and Pecona, and Galera, and the blog mentioning any of these magic words will pass the mechanical sensors of the Plant MariaDB blog aggregator. Also, the Pecona community blog is now aggregated on the planet MariaDB, which I then, of course, encourage you to follow. Now, we did not do this because uh, we are saints. It's just our interpretation of what is right for the community from a MariaDB Foundation perspective. Oracle had another interpretation for Planet MySQL from their perspective. So uh, don't let that overshadow my overall, I don't let that overshadow my overall picture of Oracle. And now I encourage you to listen carefully uh, because I will now give some kudos. Hats off uh, to Oracle for taking care of MySQL much better than I had thought they would. MySQL still exists, it's still being sold and marketed, it's still being developed 10 years after Oracle acquired Sun Microsystems. And uh, hats off also to Percona. Percona helps uh, MySQL keep MySQL alive, so kudos to Peter for making MySQL more usable. Uh, the question in the ethical session, uh, section are about the attitude to open source, so the business model, uh, the co who controls the roadmap, are there meetings where the community can air their wishes for the roadmap, uh, what's the attitude towards uh, uh, code contributions, do you accept them or do you encourage them, what is the governance model, and is the development done in the open where everything is dumped when it's ready, one time drop, or can the steps be followed uh, in an open Jira uh, ticket tracker? Is the release model uh, aligned with the community expectations? Here, I believe that MariaDB fares fairly well in the comparison. So, as for governance, in the case of MariaDB, we have dual entities. I represent MariaDB Foundation, and there's also MariaDB Corporation which is a commercial entity with 250 employees. It's venture capital owned, and from a technical standpoint, it employs most MariaDB developers. The foundation has 10 employees, and we are independent from the corporation. The corporation is one out of many uh, members, with the others also contributing to the MariaDB server. Others on the top tiers of Platinum and Gold are Microsoft, IBM, Alibaba, Tencent, ServiceNow, as providers of IT infrastructure, and Booking.com, Visma, and DBS Bank as top-level users. And governance, hence, is such that there are some checks and balances in the case of MariaDB. The interest of the user base are being looked after because we are mandated to, to do so. Uh, they are not at the sole mercy of one uh, vendor. So, um, Another point here is, is uh, in the comparison is backwards compatibility with data formats not changing from release to release. We're still big on making migration easy in all possible directions, including away from MariaDB. That was the trigger that in 99 got me to try out MySQL when Monty said it's super easy to get out of if you don't like it. I verified his statement and noted it was true. So I stayed for 10 years because of the uh, part of, of least resistance. So um, I'll make a short uh, jump into something else here. I encourage everybody, uh, this is not databases, this is health, and this is a challenge to every database, uh, be it uh, a 
sea lion or a dolphin or, or a, an elephant. I think uh, we can uh, do something to promote health in these times and jointly enjoy uh, life. Uh, th this is an initiative started by a couple of colleagues from ISL and myself. So we're going to run on the 20th of June 2020 with social distancing wherever we are. I encourage you to take a look at this website, solstice-run.com. It's a fairly geeky thing and we have a couple of blogs on, on exactly what, what this is about. So let's do some running. So, Maria Divi, Tendot 4 and the competition was the topic. And the process of selecting the right database, it is a complex one. How it's done in practice is different from how it's pretended to be done. My goal and the goal of Maria Divi Foundation is to make your, your path of least resistance point towards Maria Divi server. And we have some work to do to get there. And we need your help to point out to us what the most important steps that we are missing are. So I hope to have guided your thinking in how to make the right choice for your particular situation. Thank, I thank you. And uh, uh, this was my first virtual keynote and I, I, I enjoyed the experience. Let's, let's meet on, on Slack and, uh, and other places. Thanks.